Praise God. We just love the fact that we are continually interacting with God in the Christian life. That's partly what we're going to look at, actually, uh, in this message. I've, co- I've called this message Sent to Be Witnesses, to be His Witnesses. Um, if you've read any of the English Puritans, which I would strongly recommend that you do, those uh, 17th century divines, as they're called, who wrote so extensively, you'll discover that most published versions of their books have shortened titles. And this is my Puritan title for this sermon. The normal Christian life, once you realise that Jesus is the Son of God, died for the sins of the world and rose on the third day. That's the message today. This is the normal Christian life. And I call it the normal Christian life that we're sent to be witnesses because in the New Testament, telling others about him knowing that you are an ambassador of Christ wherever you go and in whatever context, that you're sent as a witness, that you're looking for opportunities to share the gospel or share something about Christ is absolutely normal and central for all followers of His. Christian discipleship included proclaiming a life-saving message. It wasn't just about reforming yourself or you know, getting fixed up yourself, which is all part of it. It wasn't all about working on other believers and helping them. Sanctification, that is becoming more and more like Jesus, included seeking and saving those who are lost. The more you become like Jesus, the more you will wanna be like Him. And he came seeking and saving those who were lost. One of Jesus' very earliest discipleship promises, you'll remember, was to a group of fishermen, Simon and the others. And what did he say to them? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will train you, equip you, change you, transform. I will help you become those who bring others to me. He will make us into effective soul winners as we follow Him closely. When the church was scattered from Jerusalem, do you remember, because of the persecution, what did they do? We don't read that they, you know, accessed lawyers and tried to get their possessions back. Or what we read is those who had been scattered preached the Word wherever they went. Early Christianity was missional. The default mode of Christianity is missional. And as we continue this God, us and others theme that as elders we've, we've felt this is what God wants us to emphasise, uh, throughout this year I suspect that the loving God part will be good at. I hope we will. I also suspect that the discipling others or being discipled by, by other believers will also be, hopefully, will be good at. I think it's this aspect of the normal Christian life that we will need more continual reminders about because for some reason, it's this aspect of the Christian life that we find more difficult. Evangelism, which is compassionately serving others with a communication of the good news about who Jesus is, that's the one that through my Christian life at least and through my leadership experience over decades, that's been the one that we need help with. So with that in mind as a kind of introductory statement, let's re-enter first century Palestine and huddle into a conversation which Jesus is having with his followers in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we'll read the 24 verses. Uh, Luke writes, after this, that is, after the 12 had already been sent out, the apostles had already been sent out, and after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and after Jesus tells them that he now reveals to them that he's going to die for the world and rise again from the dead, and then he was transfigured before them, after this, 
the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We know this is a phrase that Jesus liked to use. He uses it in another situation later on. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And what's the next word? <laughs> Do you like that? Pray about this. Pray that God would send out workers. Okay, now go. It's a bit like, um, I don't know, if one of the pastors would say, look, pray about giving, you know. Now give. <laughs> pray about giving to the work of, of, of the church. Now let's pass around the baskets. It's that kind of thing. It's like pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers and go. I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. And obviously they're expecting hospitality for however long they stay there. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. And when you, en when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal those there who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. This command to perform miracles was not, it was given to the apostles, but it wasn't exclusively given to the apostles or those who would write scripture. Clearly, Jesus is telling ordinary Christians, these 72 others, actually, you're not only to preach the gospel, you're to lay hands on the sick, you're to minister to people's needs as well, you're to heal, heal those who are ill. It's a command, the same as love your neighbour as you love yourself. Heal those who are sick and preach, telling them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and you're not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even this dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day than for Sodom, than for that town. Sorry, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable, bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Wow. The 72 returned with joy. I said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Wow, that great passage. Well, three points that hopefully we'll get through. First of all, uh, God's sovereignty and our responsibility. That's one of the things that this passage kind of shouts at me. Evangelism is something of a mystery. It is a mystery. Last week, Matt reminded us that we only understand who Jesus really is by revelation. You remember? Who do you say I am? Asked Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
said Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. Christianity is a religion of revelation and we can give people data, we can give you teaching, we can show you examples of reformed and improved lives or healed lives, but in the end, God has to act directly for you to realise that this is the most important thing in the world and that Jesus is who He says He is and that God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit is the only true and living God. It's by revelation. And here we see a similar thing. No one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Now, when we get back into our Romans series, which we will in a few weeks' time, we'll see this in Romans chapter 9. I personally find this scriptural emphasis absolutely thrilling. I kind of feel sometimes that I shouldn't because not everyone does, but I do for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it explains my conversion to me. How is it that I could come from such a hostile, anti-Christian position to, effect, well, to giving the whole of my adult life to proclaiming this message? What was it that affected that massive kind of turnaround? Whoa, how delicious. The Son chose to reveal the Father to me. Isn't that tremendous? So it helps explain my own story. And then secondly, it gives me greater confidence in evangelism because God promises to be active. How is it that we think that He would come down from heaven, live a perfect life, die on the cross for our sins, be raised from the dead, ascend into heaven, and yet not want to reveal why He did that? Why He went through all of that? Of course He does. He wants to reveal Himself to others. So it gives me confidence in evangelism because there's a promise that God will be active. It means that as we witness, God will work in the hearts of people for whom we may have thought, oh, there's no, there's no way that person's going to get converted. I mean, no way that person's going to respond. No, 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 no. Listen to this one in the book of Acts. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to believe the things spoken by Paul. This is a consistent teaching throughout the New Testament that God is sovereign and that God is active as we take steps of faith. If evangelism, ah, oh, what a nightmare. If evangelism was just a case of trying to persuade someone that my belief is better than your belief, forget it, what's the point of that? If it all comes down to the flesh, it's just like a battle of the flesh you know, then we just need to put forward the most self-assured or the, the most wealthy or famous or intelligent or beautiful or the happiest Jimmy in the room and push them forward and say, go on, you do the evangelism for us because there's zero activity of God in this. It's all about social credibility. The idea that in evangelism, we are kind of sent to do a bit of work and God's not active. He's kind of watching from a distance and it's down to us to try and persuade someone. I think that's unbiblical view of evangelism for a start, but it's also like a hapless task. Well, no wonder you don't want to do it if that's what you think it is. We would be working and serving and trying to be as nice as nice as we could be, forgiving and putting up with a whole load of nonsense in order to try and persuade someone to believe as though all rested on me, all apart from the activity of God. Well, then we would need celebrities to do evangelism or people who have fleshly credibility with people. No, if God is active in evangelism, hallelujah, then you don't need to be perfect you don't need to try and present the most competent version of yourself or your Instagram version of yourself to someone. You can say, hey, God's still working on me. I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect, but I know someone who is and He loves me and He loves you and His name is Jesus and the door's open for you. Why don't you come in and have a look? For me, that seems a much better uh, and more plausible option in terms of witnessing. 
if we have this God absent view of evangelism, then I think the second thing is we'll feel like this is embarrassing. If we talk to someone, it's gonna be embarrassing and it'll probably put them off because obviously God's not active in the sharing of the gospel. So when I say it, it's just gonna put them off. But the Bible teaches us that God's word is powerful in itself and that faith comes by hearing God's word, by hearing the gospel. And so I think we ought to be quoting Jesus and scripture all the time. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and the holy angels. The miracle is this, God works through his word. He works as we speak. So you're probably right in saying, oh, this person will never believe. This person is not likely to believe. But the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and can make change happen by itself, by the power of the Holy Spirit. His Word doesn't come back to him empty without accomplishing the thing it was sent to do. So when you quote Scripture, when you speak about God's purpose in Christ to rescue us, He will be active. Believe it. It's about us believing it. Even if the seed sown doesn't immediately bear fruit, something's gone in. And I think every single one of us who's been converted from a non-Christian position to a Christian position can tell you stories of how a seed, however strangely it came to us, a seed was sown that didn't necessarily immediately sprout up, but was kind of lodged and eventually came to fruition. In Galatians, Paul says this, for he, God, who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. What an amazing phrase. He's, he's saying that God who worked for Peter in the proclamation of the gospel to the Jews, worked for me also in the proclamation of the gospel to the Gentiles. He worked through me. He was active in evangelism. We need to believe it. So it's a mystery. We step out, we pray for healing, we preach the gospel, we're looking, that's the application of this whole sermon, look for opportunities, look for opportunities to share the gospel and then God acts through us to bring about the obedience of faith. Let's not try and guess whether we think Jesus is likely or not likely to reveal the Father to this person. Off of that pedestal, that's not your choice, that's not your decision, that's not your job. Your job is to share the good news of Jesus. It's up to Him to reveal the Father to people. We can't make it happen, we can't stop it happening, hallelujah. Our job is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, that's what we've been told to do. One caution here, of course, just in case you're misapplying this, is the normal application of wisdom and common sense in, in your situation, which is usually about the manner with which we speak. So the Bible exhorts us to, uh, uh, with gentleness, it says, correcting those in opposition. With gentleness, correcting those in opposition. Uh, and let your speech be seasoned with salt so as to, so to, give, so as to give grace to the hearer. So you need to apply wisdom. And of course, if sharing your conversion about Christ puts you in immediate danger, you need to be wise about whether you share or how you share that <clears throat> as well. And that is a reality too. But when someone is genuinely converted or healed, and if you've prayed for the sick and you've seen them healed, or you've shared the gospel and they've been like, properly converted, you will know, <clears throat> although you played a vital role in it, actually God did it. Yeah, I mean, that's just, you know that from experience. That if you shared the gospel with someone or you did a study with them or they came to Alpha, whatever it was, and they've been genuinely and permanently, they've been properly born again, you know, oh wow. Because your thing is, is it gonna last? Is it gonna, is it gonna take? And then you hear, no, no still healed, or no, still loving Jesus, 
going to church regularly, joining the church. You know, think, wow, God did that. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing through this whole passage. The Son reveals the Father to people. And God is active. And sometimes that activity is a surprise. I remember years ago now, when we were still one congregation and in uh, Weinberg Boys High, I was telling the congregation in a sermon how I just had this quirky conversation with someone in pick and pay. Because as we were walking around and, you know, shopping, I, under, under, well, not just quite under my breath, but I was singing the, the song Marley Bongwe, you know, the, old, the older one. Marley Bongwe, Marley Bongwe. And I'm singing it as I'm telling the congregation this. As I'm singing it, someone stopped me and said, hey, how come you're singing our songs? And I said, well, it's, it's, it's the church I go to. And she kind of looked me up and down. What church do you go to that sing our songs? And I said, well, it's Jubilee. I've never heard of that. And we had this little conversation afterwards. So I'm telling the congregation this and like, just like it's a quirky little story and it's fun and we should be like on the front foot. And as I tell you, I, I began to sing it like I did now and the congregation picked it up and we started singing together Marley Bongwe. That morning, there was a first time visitor to church who had come, he'd found his way to Weinberg Boys and he's praying, God speak to me. And this all happened. And guess what his name was? Yeah, his name was Marley Bongwe. And, and, and as he heard this, Strange, the white English guy badly singing Molly and the congregation, because he'd been praying, God, speak to me. I need to know if you're real. And he felt, wow, God spoke to me. He came forward at the end of that sermon. He gave his life to Christ and his story later appeared in a magazine, which is about the only kind of authentic <laughs> occasion I've got for that story. But, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful act of God. So this idea that it's all us, it's all on us to try and use all our skill to convince someone. Um, I forget the name of the guy, one of the kind of great logical apologists. Um, uh, oh, I forget his name, in America. Uh, he spent his whole life doing apologetics and, and um, Craig, what's his name? Yeah, William Lane Craig, thank you. Uh, he was converted because there was someone in his class at university, a German young woman, who was always happy, and it really annoyed him. It's like, why are you so happy all the time? And so he said to her one day, why are you happy all the time? And she said, because Jesus is my Lord and Saviour. And that's so kind of a, kind of a cliche, isn't it? And it just went in like an arrow. And it absolutely upset his whole worldview, his thinking. He then started reading the Gospels and he gave his life to Christ. And that was actually the moment that did it. Something as simple as that. We need to look for opportunities. Because she could have said, well, I'm, I'm German. I don't know. <laughs> that wouldn't, no, that's not the answer. She could <laughs> that couldn't have been the answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, nine. So, so she, she could have said any number of different things. You know, I was in a situation, I'm off my notes now, this is terrible. I'm, I was in a situation this last week where uh, my daughter had started teaching or assistant teaching in a school in Mitchell's Plain. And as she drove back uh, from school one afternoon, someone threw a rock at her car. You know, you know these stories. On the end too, it hit the bonnet of the car and it damaged it. And um, the annoying thing is that she had to pay an excess of five and a half thousand rand because she's under 25. And the insurance company said to me, you know, if you've been driving it, uh, obviously there's no excess. But because she was driving it, there's all this blah, blah, blah. So I'm at the panel beater's place getting it fixed and paying the excess in order to get them to do it. And the guy, and I'm getting on quite well with, there's the lady there and there's the, these two mechanic guys there. And 
we're getting on quite well and it's very kind of, you know, jovial. And when he says, but did she stop or did she carry on driving? I said, no, she kind of kept her head and she kept driving. She didn't crash it, she didn't, and we just reported. And the guy said to me, um, well, you could have just said it was you driving the car. And I said, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that. Do you know what I first said? This is terrible. I said, I'm a bit too English. <laughs> as soon as I said it, I thought, that's not true. Why are you saying that? So I said, well, it's because I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. The shame that came on him. <laughs> but the lady that was there was like, ha! So, you know, it didn't develop into a full-blown Christian, you know, or evangelistic moment. But, you know, we, we, we so often, we even, I mean, I'm preaching this, but I veer away from it too. We don't make the most of every opportunity, which Paul says we should. Okay, I'm going to try and get through this now. Second point. <coughs> so the first point is God's active. God's active. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. God is active. Let's believe it. So when we think of witnessing, which is a normal central part of being a disciple of Jesus for every single one of us as followers, he's active. He's not inactive. We're not doing a God-less activity. God is involved. Second point, the problem of possible failure, which is obviously a major part of this passage that we read. We are hypersensitive to the possibility of failure in evangelism. And Jesus addresses it. You know, we're so attuned to the possibility of awkwardness for the person <laughs> as well as for us, that we stay silent rather than speak when an opportunity ar ar arises. I've just illustrated that. And any time in the past where we've stepped out and we've tried to share the gospel and it's kind of gone pear-shaped, we think it didn't work, it became kind of negative, like what Jesus describes, we, we don't say, oh, I shake my dust, off, you know, internally, I'm shaking the dust off my feet for this person. We think, oh, we did it wrong. We're not gifted. Evangelism isn't for me. I'll serve God in lots of other ways, but I'm not going to do that. Evangelism is probably for thick-skinned extroverts who are obviously socially inept and unaware. They can't read the room. They just blunder their way through whatever conversation it is. And we kind of, kind of paint this picture in our minds, and you occasionally hear preachers do that as well, which is a bit naughty. Why are we so reluctant to share that Jesus is the answer? Why? Why are we so reluctant? He's the answer. Haven't we given our lives to him? Why, why do we believe that the consequences of us sharing about Jesus would probably be negative rather than thinking the consequences of sharing about Jesus would probably be positive because God is involved? And of course, I think it's, partly a spiritual warfare item. The devil doesn't want you to share the gospel. The devil doesn't want the gospel, the word of God being shared. First prize, this is a little bit of um, uh, screw tape. If you've read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, it's a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm going into that territory a little bit. Um, this is a bit like first prize that for the devil is you don't, think at all about sharing Christ in your normal day. It's just not on the radar. You're, you, there's no evangelistic antenna up. You're not praying for opportunities and looking for them. It's not even there. That's first prize for the devil. Second, second prize, second strategy is, oh, you become aware. Here's an opportunity where I could share my faith. And then, of course, right at that moment, the devil's right there saying, not now. This isn't the right moment. It's going to be like, not, ooh, ooh, not now. Uh, or, <laughs> not here. This is not the right context. You know, this is like, you shouldn't, not here. Not to him or to her. Um, you know, they're not open and it won't go well. So not now, not here, not to that person, and then finally, not through you. Uh, he might remind you of a sin you committed just two days ago or something like that. He might say, you're not intelligent enough. He doesn't respect you. Look at you. You're, you're, a, you're a nobody. You're, 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 a, you're, you know, you're not an influential person. You're not intelligent enough. He might ask you a question and you haven't got a clue and then it'll all go downhill from there. You're not well-educated enough. You're not equipped enough. You're not da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. 
Who are you going to believe? Are we going to believe Jesus who said, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you and chose a bunch of labourers to change the world, which they did and have done and continue to do amazingly through their writings. As the Father sent me, and how will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless someone preaches them? Or are you going to believe the devil who says, did God really say, do that to you? Is it really a word to you? And what if they do reject us? What if they do, what if someone does speak dismissively to us? What if it doesn't work? Which I think is where the mistake comes in. It didn't work. Jesus is really robust about it. I said it already. Even the dust of your town we've wiped from our feet. Wow, that's like, really? But be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. So Jesus expects us to realise that we are carrying the kingdom of God wherever we go. Wherever you go, I mean, this came to me as a brand new Christian very strongly. Wherever I go, I've got the truth. I now know the truth. So whatever context, whoever I'm speaking with, whoever's in the room, whoever's in the situation, I know the truth and the truth has set me free. You are a carrier of the kingdom of God. He, he says that's true of you. And then he also says, whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. Wow. That's a huge investment of trust in us, isn't it? As we speak about him, he really believes that you, Christian, you are an ambassador for him. So yes, please behave well. <laughs> so yeah, we must behave <coughs> well, <coughs> but... We've got to also speak. We can't just behave well. My, my sister, after she got converted a little while, about six months after me, she was just, just kind of telling everyone any opportunity and she was told by an older Christian, listen, you know, just you know, work on your personality and character and don't be so vocal about Jesus. And that probably was good advice. So she uh, got a part-time job in a, like a shoe shop and uh, she thought, okay, new situation. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm just going to be really nice and my character will shine through. And then one Monday, uh, one of her colleagues came into the show and said, I've just become a Christian this weekend. And my sister said, oh, I'm a Christian. And the girl said, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. I just thought you were like nice. One of the ways, and we're, I think, specifically susceptible to this, one of the ways that preachers have exhorted us to be witnesses is by telling us genuine, I mean, authentic stories of how they've been led by the Holy Spirit to share. And I, I'm not knocking that. It's a wonderful thing. There's a famous story of John Wimber on an aeroplane and he's sitting on the aisle seat and across the aisle on the other seat he just suddenly saw the word adultery appear in a kind of a flash over this guy's head. I'm not recommending you follow Wimber's process on this. Anyway, um, and he thought, oh, wow, that was weird. And so he prayed about it. And a little while later, he looked at the guy and he saw the, the, a, a woman's name written across the guy's forehead. And he thought, hmm, this feels like I'm supposed to say something. Anyway, he got into a conversation with this guy. Turns out he had been unfaithful to his wife. He was in a, an adulterous relationship with a woman and that was her name. He was convicted of his sin. They prayed together in that moment. Now, that's one of those stories. Nothing like that's ever happened to me. <laughs> But there may have been wonderful times when the Holy Spirit has prompted you to speak to someone and it has gone well. But I've got lots of stories of where I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and it's just like, oh, okay, all right, well, thanks. And that was it. Um, and because we're people of the Holy Spirit, these stories we love. The challenge, therefore, for us is that He has already spoken to us about witnessing. And in fact, he's commanded us 
to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So in that sense, you, you're the default position. That's why I said at the beginning, the default mo mode for your life is missional. He's already told us this. And if we needed a sign, the sign was he died and rose again from the dead and is alive forevermore. That's the sign. And it was after that and just before he ascended that he said, all authority in heaven, I was to me, go, preach the gospel, make disciples, and I'll be with you even to the end of the age. So we've, we've had the word and we've had the prompt and we've got a promise that he'll be with us in this work. So don't misunderstand me. I've enjoyed those, I would say, fairly rare moments where I've been prompted by the Spirit to, to speak to others. But what you'll find if you're active in evangelism is other Christians who, bless them, aren't really doing evangelism will try and kind of tone it down a little bit. Now, we, we're not wanting to release maniacs into Cape Town. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. We want to release you. Mm. <laughs> John Wesley was the, one of the most effective evangelists in church history. That multiplied thousands of people came to Christ and he himself was told, to, listen, you just preach the gospel everywhere you go. You need to be led by the Spirit. It's in the flesh, you know. So he writes in his journal this, Monday, June 8th, 1741. For these two days, I had made an experiment which I had been so often and earnestly pressed to do, speaking to none, no one concerning the things of God, i.e. witnessing, unless my heart was free to it. So unless there's this kind of subjective prompting to do it. And what was the event? So he did this experiment for two days. Why? One that I spoke to none at all for four score miles together, 80 miles together, no, not even to him that travelled with me in the carriage, unless a few words at first setting out. Two, that I had no cross either to bear or take up and commonly in an hour or two fell fast asleep. Three, that I had much respect shown me wherever I came, everyone behaving to me as to a civil, good-natured gentleman. Oh, how pleasing is all this to flesh and blood. Sure, if the Spirit prompts you, be obedient, respond, still applying wisdom, but you don't really need a prompt. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Amen. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. You will be my witnesses. Final point, very quickly, Jesus' joy in our success. So the 70 returned with news of great results, didn't they? They were overjoyed and so was Jesus. Even the demons submit to us in your name. And he says, I, I know, I saw I have, I had Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It was absolutely wonderful. I've given you authority to heal a sick, cast out demons, preach the gospel, nothing will harm you. But don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice your names are written in heaven. And at that time, full of joy in the Holy Spirit, he prayed, Thank you, Father, that you've kept these things from the hyper-intelligent. You've, you've revealed them to these little babes, these children, because you, it was pleasing in your sight. Other translations say, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. What did it look like to see Jesus rejoicing greatly in the Holy Spirit? When we step out in faith and God is acting with us to help move someone towards him or to help them be healed or whatever it is, Je Jesus rejoices. The Father's glorified. He says it in another place. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit. Our fruitfulness doesn't lift us up. Our fruitfulness in God glorifies the Father. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit. God wants you to be very, very fruitful. In whatever area of kingdom work it is, He wants you to be fruitful. And your fruitfulness glorifies Him. Hallelujah. And He just wants you to remember that the fruit that you get and the fruit that we'll get together as a church emanates from Him, not from us. That's the point. It emanates from Him. We rejoice, but we maintain perspective in our successes by giving thanks more often 
that he's blessed us by forgiving our sins and reconciling us to him than that he's blessed us by giving us success. Whether in work, in life, family, how well our kids are doing, how well we, we think we're doing in, in our working life. He wants this shift. He's rejoicing with you. But he wants you to remember, hey, the big thing, the big blessing, the main blessing is your sins have been forgiven. Your name's written in the book of life. You can't lose your salvation. You're going to get there in the end. Hallelujah. I'm going to finish with one last exhortation from Acts 8, 9. This was the first text I ever preached at Jubilee in, in, uh, in 1996. Uh, the Lord said to Paul, this is Acts 8, verse 9. The Lord said to Paul by a vision at night, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. God's saying to Paul, there was no church there. God's saying to Paul, don't be silent. Don't be afraid. Speak up. I've got many people in this city. They're uncalled. They're not yet justified. They're not yet sanctified. They're not yet converted. But I have them. Preach the gospel. And my purpose and your obedience will combine in a very, very fruitful outcome. And I believe that's what God's saying to each one of us. He's got things for you to do and he's got people who you can reach that he's going to bring to himself. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's look for every opportunity. This week, next week, this year. Look for the opportunities. Take this exhortation and pray in the morning. God, would you give me an opportunity? Would you help my missional evangelistic antenna to be up so that we might reach people for Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. We're going to sing. Father, we want to pray that as a people we would obey you. We would enter the joy of harvest. We would enter that joy that you yourself feel as people come to know you. We pray, God, that you would make us individually the means of bringing people to Christ, that as we share the good news, you, Lord, would be revealing, you'd be choosing to reveal the Father to this one, that one, this one, that one, and we would be able to say, wow, look at these multitudes who have joined us in this journey to heaven. Amen. Amen.